Good afternoon, everyone. So we just spoke, th thank you for the panelists who covered Asia. I think it was very interesting. Nat natural transition, when you speak about China, generally you speak about commodities. So thank you for la laying the ground on, the, on our discussion. So we have uh, two impressive investors uh, uh, close to me, actually, to discuss uh, commodities today and a little bit global macro. So before starting our discussion, I will ask just the two of you to introduce yourself and your firm, what you are doing, and after we can start our discussion. So jo Jonathan, you want to start? Uh, hi, I'm John Goldberg. I'm the CIO of BBL Commodities. Uh, we're a relative value-focused energy and commodity funds. Our focus is on uh, oil and refined products, as well as natural gas. Uh, prior to starting BBL, uh, I ran uh, energy trading at Glencore. I'm Anthony Grisanti. Um, I'm the president of GRZ Energy. I've been in the commodities business for about 30 years uh, as a trader, uh, a consultant. Uh, I had a floor or an operation on the floor of the commodities exchange. Um, where we executed orders, but now we've transitioned since it's gone electronic to um, basically consulting. Um, my focus is mostly energy, but I've traded gold, uh, followed those markets very well, the grains, the softs, um, all the metals, really. Thank you. So my first question will be... Uh pretty broad and we will become more granular afterwards. So if you look at the macro space and the commodity space, obviously there is a very strong correlation between geopolitics, macro and commodities. So what are the themes on the macro side you are focusing on, on the ones that have a significant impact on the commodity market? And symmetrically, what are the themes on the commodity side you think have a big impact currently on the, on the macro uh, outlook? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is, is growth. Um, you know, the global growth numbers have been uh, strong. About 90% of countries are growing above trend. And what we like to do is look at those aggregate global growth numbers that you see generally reported and see if they square away with what we're seeing in commodity demand numbers and the micro commodity demand numbers. And the short of it is that we are. Uh, in Q2, oil demand grew about 2.2 million barrels a day, which is an incredibly strong number. Uh, gas demand in Asia has been incredibly strong as well. Metals have had a big rally, uh, all consistent with the growth numbers that we're seeing. So what we like to see is if there's a break between some of the big picture growth numbers and the commodity numbers, either the commodity numbers are telling you the world is doing better and or doing worse than what you're seeing. And if anything, we're seeing uh, better than trend numbers out of some of the energy markets that we're seeing. We can also see that in refined products where things like gasoline and diesel have been outperforming crude, which is generally a sign of a very healthy consumer market. Okay. I'm looking at the metals. Um, copper is what I'm following mostly. Um, you know, there's uh, some regulation changes that might happen in China that could be very positive for the copper market. Uh, they don't want to import scrap copper anymore. They want to try to clean the atmosphere up. Uh, so that means they have to um, either mine their own copper, buy it from other places. Indonesia would be a big one. But when you're talking about the growth that Jonathan mentioned as far as um, economic-wise around the world, um, demand for metals, base metals, is going to be big. Now, I'm looking at a lot of these countries that produce these, and, and they're countries that, um, geopolitical, some of them are at risk um, to what happens. And that usually, when you have metals in countries that emerging markets, um, that usually happens because that's the only thing they have to sell at this point. Um, they're not producing much more. So I think the metal space, um, I'm bullish on that, definitely. The grains I'm bullish on, uh, you know, population of the world is always growing. So, um, And oil itself, not so much. Um, but the products, diesel especially, I'm looking at huge growth in that market. So if you look now at the uh, opportunities that we're going to focus more on the trading and investment side, so what, what are your top convictions, both on the directional side and on the relative value side? And I know both of you do relative value uh, a lot. Well, if we're talking about crude oil specifically, you know, the, the big um, thing is the Aramco IPO. Um, you know, crude oil is, is derived by, from dinosaurs, and uh, I think it's becoming a dinosaur, actually. 
When you look at um, the alternatives, it was 2% about 15 years ago, alternatives in the energy market. Now it's about 14%. It grows every day. Um, Jonathan mentioned demand for energy increasing 2.2 million in the first quarter, but we didn't see that in the gasoline demand in the US. Uh, every barrel of crude oil, half of it refined is made into gasoline. We're just not seeing that demand anymore, and that's really due to, um, to efficiency, to alternatives. Uh, we also have the Amazon effect in oil. Um, instead of 100 people going to stores to buy what they need, they're getting it delivered right to their houses. Uh, by one delivery truck. That's eliminating a lot of the demand for gasoline. So I, I do like the products um, it, around the world more than I do in the U.S. I don't like crude oil. I don't like the Aramco IPO. I, I, I just think that the way alternatives are happening right now, I, I would not invest uh, if it ever comes to fruition. I, I don't think that um, demand for oil will grow. I think that uh, it, it's a market that is kind of fading. And 15 years from now, it'll be a completely different marketplace. And I don't think crude oil would get over $100 a barrel back to that 140 level until it becomes a, uh, a specialty item. And only a few people use it and only a few people need it at that point. Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, we, we see things uh, differently. Um, I think in the long term, there's some structural challenges to, to oil. Uh, one of our favorite trades is we like being sort of long the front of the curve, short the back of the curve, uh, because I think actually in the near term, um, gasoline demand actually is, is, is growing. Um, it's growing globally. It's growing in the U.S. Diesel demand's been fantastic. Uh, I agree that over time, you're going to see pressure from EVs. You're going to see, you see it in the paper every day. The transition is a very real thing. Uh, it will happen and it will be important. But a bigger trend is the fact that the world is growing and oil demand growth still is most highly correlated to global growth, which is strong. And uh, we anticipate that in 2018, we'll see another 1.6 million barrels a day or so of demand growth, so slightly worse than 2017, but still quite good. Uh, over the long term, I agree. Over the long term, oil demand will peak, but our investment horizon, I think, is shorter than that matters for. Uh, I don't see oil demand peaking until 2020 time frame. So for the next six to 12 months is where most of our trades are. Uh, the market looks pretty constructive. So trades that we like, uh, we, we agree on diesel. We think diesel cracks will remain good. Uh, diesel will outperform crude. Uh, we think global crude will outperform US crude. If you look at oil inventories throughout the world, there's actually no excess inventory anywhere other than in Cushing, Oklahoma. So WTI has been quite weak relative to other things. We think that remains the case going forward uh, because we've actually done a great job reducing floating storage globally uh, and storage in places like Saldana Bay in South Africa, where most of this sort of excess that we built up over the last two, three years, it's gone. Uh, there is no excess inventory in those places. So we like being long other things versus U.S. crude, and we think the front end of the curve is going to be strong relative to the back end of the curve. Uh, the long-term trends, we think um, you should not be trading those in the commodity itself. So you mentioned, Anthony, the IPO of Aramco. That's the big elephant in the room, you know, uh, when we look at uh, oil markets. So two questions. First, do you think it will happen? And second, whatever your answer, what does it tell us about the oil market and the view of Saudi Arabia on, on oil markets? I think it'll be um, difficult to bring this to the market, the IPO. Number one, when you do the IPOs, obviously there's, there's accounting rules, there's transparency, uh, things like that. And I don't think the Saudis are ready for that kind of scrutiny in their markets yet. They made a trip to um, Russia last week to discuss the oil deal, and the Saudis brought a 1,200-person entourage. Um, there was a gold staircase leading from the, the plane down to the ground, and that's going to have to stop. You can't bring 1,200 people to a meeting and expect the, um, you know, the, the oil revenue to pay for that. Um, they have one thing that they sell, the Saudis, and that's oil. I think buying into that IPO would actually be subsidizing their lifestyles rather than, um, you know, an investment into oil. Um, I think they need to get themselves under control, and then maybe it'll happen. 
Um, I heard that it's been pushed back to maybe 2019 now, or they might just have private investment and not take it public. But either way, there's a lot of problems there. You know, the Saudis, um, they actually need oil at $80 a barrel, not uh, $50 a barrel. And um, if they don't get it, there's going to be a lot of issues, geopolitical issues, out of the Middle East. Um, there's a lot that's subsidized there. Gasoline, we're talking less than 50 cents a gallon in a lot of these countries. And as their revenues drop, as their reserves, their money reserves drop, they're going to have to eliminate some of those subsidies. And it could cause a lot of problems going forward as far as that. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't trade securities, as you know, so no, no view on uh, the IPO, whether it happens or not. Um, the most recent news is that they pulled their marketing team, so it would seem that it's been sidetracked. Uh, uh, would seem that it's been sidetracked. Um, what does it mean for oil markets? I think it means they're seeing the same trends that everybody else does. I mean, I, the Saudis recognize that there are structural problems for long-term oil demand, and they'd like to pull some of the revenue forward. Um, I, I think it's a recognition of trend. Um, and they certainly have issues with spending patterns, and we're not currency traders, but the Saudis have made some smart investments in sort of new technology. They're very active in the downstream sector. They're very active in plastics and pet chems. There's been some adjustment. Uh, there's no question lower prices are worse than higher prices, but I, I, I would say that there's been some changes within the country. So back to performance, and uh, I will start with you, Jonathan. You've been able to deliver, uh, despite challenging environments, great, great track record, great performance. So what's the age uh, you need uh, to deliver returns in terms of analysis of supply demand, market technicals, why not artificial intelligence? I mean, how do you navigate this market? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, a, a t there's no one thing. I think it's a combination of a lot of what you mentioned. So when we look at, so how do you make money trading oil? It's a combination of understanding how to do sort of top level oil balances. So understanding how to use and look at publicly and privately available data, how do you manipulate that data in a sensible way and understand it? And also how to understand the, the failability of some of the data. Um, a lot of oil demand and a lot of oil supply information comes from places that aren't reliable. So the Iranian numbers, for instance, uh, <coughs> aren't as trustworthy as you might want from a normal data set. So we try to combine the fundamental analysis that we use with a network of people within the physical market, including folks that I used to work with at Glencore and other physical trading shops that have some uh, physical know-how. Uh, we spend a lot of time tracking cash markets. So physical markets that are moving uh, not so much the futures price to give you a leading indicator into what the futures curve will do. In terms of like artificial intelligence, um, there's been an a entirely new industry popping up. I think it's uh, helpful in a lot of trading platforms, maybe in equities and some other things. We try to incorporate that into what we're doing, but with massive caveats that the challenge with using sort of artificial intelligence satellite technology when it comes to oil trading is there's not often an arbiter of what's right. So if you have a private satellite company that tells you inventories in China are drawing based on satellite imageries they're using to track a particular set of tanks, there's no way to tell whether that's actually true or not because the Chinese don't give you the data to know whether the answer is correct. So uh, we're skeptical of using that to too big an extent in how we trade. Myself, um you know, our approach is similar to Jonathan's. We use, uh, we follow the cash markets, obviously. I have a lot of colleagues in those markets that I talk to every day. Um, we meld the technicals and fundamentals together to decide. Um, you know, if you're looking for specific investments, I, I'm thinking about natural gas right now. Uh, the demand for that is growing all the time. It's relatively cheap compared to the other commodities. It hasn't really rebounded yet because of uh, the fracking and the shell producers are just, they're so efficient and excellent in what they do. Um, but we are now building liquid plants to export it. Um, there is one in Maryland done right now. There's going to be two more in line by, uh, I think, the end of uh, 2019. So when that starts, I, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities in the natural gas market. I think you'll, you'll see the prices uh, a lot higher from where they are right now. You'll see demand grow. Uh, we've already seen that as uh, the alternative to coal, the alternative to oil. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities 
in that space right now. And, and we use the same kind of investment technique for that. You know, it's, it's the technicals and it's the fundamentals in the market. What's cash doing? And the beauty of about natural gas is you don't have to worry about storage so much. So what you're taking out of the ground is pretty much what you're using. And uh, I think that we're going to be using a lot more within the next five or ten years. So if we focus now on the more structural changes of the commodity space, you know, I mean, I think it has been a very challenging time for the space. If you look at just banks retrenching their prop capital exposure, that has been really a lingering trend. If you look at banks producing factors, you know, trying to replicate, you know, all these alternative risk premier or quantitative way. Uh, a lot of quant firms also, CTAs, macros, doing things more uh, systematically. So if you put all that together and you have an audience of uh, investors in front of you, why do you think smart investors like investment banks reduce their exposure there? How do you think you are going to make money and what kind of return we can expect from uh, great firms like you trading uh, in the commodity space? You said reduce their exposure, correct? Yes. Yeah, you know, that, that's uh, a product of the shale revolution. Um, when the shale players really started to go, oil was trading about $80, $85 a barrel. And the, the banks were more than happy to lend that money to buy the land, to set up the, the facilities, the production, everything else. Oil's dropped. Obviously, we all know that. $26 a barrel. The banks really took it on the chin at that point. Um, you know, a lot of them lost the investment completely. And we're still not out of the woods yet. There's, there's, a, lot of, um, there's a lot of place in North Dakota where it, it's still not profitable to produce oil or, or to take it out of the ground. There are some places in Texas that I can think of that $30 is their break even. Some are $40. Some are $50. Um, as I said, in North Dakota, it's closer to $70. So I, I think the banks are a little bit more cautious at this point because they've been burned before. And I think they see what Jonathan and I see as far as, as oil goes, that you, know, you probably won't see those super spikes anymore to $80, $90 a barrel, um, maybe 60 But at that point, you're going to bring a lot more shale producers online, knock it back down. We've seen this for the last couple of years, this kind of you know, range-bound market that we've been into. So I, I wouldn't be surprised. It's not a slam dunk anymore for a bank to invest in, in, a, in a shale player. But if you focus more on the investment opportunities, you know, yeah. because I was more referring to prop trading. Yeah, I think I, think I, I sort of understand what you're saying. I mean, in, in terms of the, a couple of things, the prop trading at the banks where... I worked at Goldman to start my career in the very public announcement yesterday about their commodity trading revenue. Um, I, a couple of things have happened. One, uh, regulations have changed, which has shifted some people out of the banks and into other places. Uh, capital requirements are a little bit higher, internal capital requirements at the banks. So the threshold to do deals uh, is higher if your cost of capital is 10% and not 2% because they're charging you more for the same sort of uh, type of business. They're less inclined to take risk in those things. And the fact is, a lot of commodities have been range-bound for the last couple of years, including oil. Um, so that's hurt some of the bank trading revenue. Um, the business has also grown, so in terms of the number of people it touches. So if you know the Goldman commodity business was a $3.5 billion business in 2010, it did so with fewer competitors, right? And the competitors aren't necessarily other banks that you see, but if you look at the commodity trade and the oil trade writ large, companies are still doing quite well. Um, in 2015 and 2016, which were challenging years for banks and a lot of sort of trade shops. It's actually a very good year for companies like Vital, Glencore, Mercuria, Trafigura, who were taking advantage of cash and carry plays, Contango in the market, uh, and those types of positions where they actually had record years. So I think the key for us as sort of investing private capital is to be nimble. Uh, don't have a bias long, don't have a bias short. Uh, we happen to think the market looks very good in the near term. Spreads are going to perform very well. That will change. Uh, eventually, oil demand will, we think, decline, and the market will go into bear territory. And I think people who are predisposed to trade the market one way or the other uh, will lose. And if you're flexible in trading commodities, it should be pretty good. 
You know, the other thing I wanted to bring up, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that question, but the other thing I wanted to bring up is high-frequency trading. Um, five years ago, the revenue from that was $7.2 billion. Last year, it was $1.7 billion. It's a lot tighter of a market right there. The margins are a lot less. And I think that's, that's reflected in, in some of the banks and their investment and how they trade. They're, they're not just seeing the profits that they did before because these, these computers are taking every little dime that they can um, and I would expect that to increase. I mean, these markets right now, when you look at it at an oil screen, these are mostly high frequency trading that you see going into this market. In fact, the ex chairman of the New York Mercantile Exchange, the, the place for oil, now owns the Virtu, which is the high frequency trading, I, I would say the, uh, the golden boy of it. Um, they've made great money over the last few years, and, and even their margins are getting squeezed at this point. So I think for the sake of time, I'd like to give the opportunity to the audience to ask a few questions. So three very short questions to, to conclude. One, the performance of your fund in the next three years annualized, I mean, in terms of opportunity set, how much do you think you can generate? Second, price of oil in one year and two years, and price of gold in one year and two years. And I know, Jonathan, you're less a gold expert, so you can skip the, the third one, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, we hate to give targeted returns because it, it's contingent on market opportunity set. So I'll answer it without giving a specific number, but give a, a broader answer if that's okay. And I think that the opportunity set in oil is actually quite good. Uh, we had a very range-bound market for the last 12 months. We're starting to break out of that range. And I think a couple of important things that will have happened that will help the opportunity set one, the inventory buffer, as I mentioned before, is gone. There is no inventory buffer for oil anymore other than the United States of America. Everywhere else is very tight in terms of inventory. Two, we had very large storms that hit the U.S. Gulf Coast this year, which had a profound impact on diesel and gasoline supply. And I think when you get to the middle of next year and it's summer gasoline season and gasoline demand is quite strong, that's when you're going to feel the impact of Hurricane Harvey and you're going to have a very good gasoline season because we're not going to have... Uh, that inventory buffer. So I, I think that opportunity set is strong. Um, in terms of price direction, I think in the near term, you'll see prices for Brent go above $60. I don't think you'll see the back of the curve move. So I think what you're going to see is very, very strong, very backwardated spreads and a back of the curve that doesn't move all of that much. That would be my prime view on the market right now. Um, it's hard to predict what the return is going to be, especially with commodities. Um, with, as Jonathan is saying, there's opportunities out there. Um, I mentioned natural gas. Jonathan mentioned the, the uh, demand for diesel, which I, I'm totally on board with him. I think you're going to see this market explode uh, coming into next year. We, we're about a 26 million barrel deficit at this point in this country right now. Um, and it, it's, it's being used. We've exported the most diesel that we have last month. Um, so we need to make that up. As far as uh, oil itself goes, uh, I'm looking at probably between WTI uh, 45 and 55 next year. If it does go over 60 itself, I think it'll be very short-lived. Uh, I mentioned how the frackers would come in. Um, so I, I think that we're going to still be range-bound in these markets, but there's opportunities in ranges as long as you can identify the range and, and, um, and take advantage of that. As far as gold prices go... Uh, I'm thinking probably about 1,200. I think the Fed will raise rates. I think that the dollar strengthens. I think money gets a lot tighter going forward. And there's going to be a lot less reasons to own gold, um, economic-wise. Geopolitical-wise, that's always an uncertainty. And you do see gold spike uh, when you do have these problems. But um, I think overall, uh, I don't really want to own gold at this point. I'd probably want to sell it. Thank you. Any question before we move to the next panel? Yes, please. Um, so the question was with the uh, budget balanced with a price of oils at $80. Uh, the question is, will Saudi Arabia go bankrupt potentially in two years or have s strong financing issues? I don't think it'll be two years, but um, here's an example of the rate they're spending money right now. Their cash reserves were $750 billion about three years ago. Now they're below $500 billion. And it's not just the Saudis. It's the Kuwaitis. It's the UAE. It's, it's all those nations. And yes, there's going to be a problem going forward. Uh, unless they can rein in their own spending, 
um, you're going to have geopolitical problems in the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to speculate on the future there, but the way the trend is going, and I don't see oil going back to $80 for them to pay the bills, so the way the trend is going, it, it's not pretty. That's true. The Russians, too. They're having problems, too. $50 oil doesn't pay the bills for them, either. Any other question? So thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Anthony. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Thank you.